March is Women's History Month, and it gives us an opportunity to reflect on the barriers that women have overcome and to celebrate what they have accomplished throughout our nation's history. If your day is filled with emails, phone calls, and the harsh glare of a computer screen, coupled with the constant bombardment of news headlines, it can be really difficult to take a step back and escape from it all. But in order to maintain our sanity, we've got to take care of ourselves. One of my favorite ways of self-care is to unplug and pick up a good book. So today, Sister Power is celebrating a woman author. Aloha and welcome to Think Tech of IE. I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, host of Sister Power. Sister Power's special guest is author Mary Ann Howland. In Mary Ann Howland's forthcoming memoir, Warrior Rising, how four men helped a boy on his journey to manhood, she tells the story of the Black Mitzvah, or rite of passage celebration. She organized for her son, Max, upon his 13th birthday, when she invited an engineer, a philanthropist, a publisher, and a financial planner over for mentorship. Marianne, welcome to Sister Power. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> it's so great to see you. And thank you so much for inviting me to be on your show. I know how hard you work on bringing really good inspirational material to your audience, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. And I want to congratulate you, Marianne. This is just phenomenal. I was so excited about your book that I took the experience of taking the time to walk into Barnes and Nobles and purchase the book, and I have not put it down since. So congratulations on this fabulous must-read book. And let's jump right in. I'm so excited. Just tell us all about Warrior Rising. Well, well, I'll start with telling you why I wrote the book. And it, it really was on demand. I had uh, not been thinking about writing a book, but when I shared with some very dear friends that I had given my son a black mitzvah for his 13th birthday, of course, the first question gets asked is, what's a black mitzvah? And so when I talk about it as a rite of passage that I created with the intent of giving my son um, mentors or a circle of men to help him uh, become the, boy, the man that he was on a journey to become and describe the impact that they had on, his, on him, I just got so much... Um, interest in, well, tell me more or tell me why you did that. And so why I did it was because my son, who was who you know, um, was born with a disability. He's got cerebral palsy and he also has ADHD. And for the first 12 years, we spent so much time focused on all of his medical journey. So between doctors and therapy and treatments and surgeries and and then even working with him through his academic challenges in school as a as a student with disabilities, navigating all of that was was exhausting. And and by the time he was approaching that age of, you know, his teenage years, I knew that he was going to have different kinds of challenges. And so I just knew I couldn't keep mothering him to death, that he really needed some men in his life who would be able to give him the foundation that he needs to find his own, find his own way, you know, to, to develop the kind of self-esteem and self-confidence that he needed as a young man. And so the, the idea of the mitzvah, um, which in the Jewish culture me really means, it's very holy, it means a holy commandment. And, and in the case of my son, the mitzvah on the part of the mentors, their deed was sacrosanct because they all stepped in to say yes to help him on his journey, understanding that this was a not a typical child, one with disabilities. And so for them, the learning process went both ways. It was not only for what my son got um, from them in terms of um, advice and counsel and, and wisdom, but it's also what 
my son was able to give to them because they, for the first time, had to really uh, dig deep um, to, to cope and, and be there for him in a very unique way. So, um, so that's what the book is about. And what I hope that people um, get from it is really just the, the idea of intentional parenting that, that, you know, that you don't have to do it alone. And as a single mom, you know, by the time he was approaching that age, I, I knew that I could no longer do it alone. Wow, that's exciting. That's, that's very interesting um, that you came up with the concept of black mitzvah. Uh, I've never been to a bar mitzvah, and I would even, I would think that this concept needs to go out to the schools because it's so important um, that our students, our children, our grandchildren have mentors in their lives. So how did you choose the four men? <laughs> well, you know, it was a it was an interesting process, and, and it wasn't necessarily that I started out to choose four men. What I did was, you know, I started, I first thought, okay, so who in our circle of friends would be ideal that I trusted? Because that was really important. I really had to trust these men that they had the values and the integrity and the honesty that... I felt comfortable with to be able to have them engage with my son in such a personal and intimate way on an ongoing basis. I had to feel confident that they were going to back me up. I had to feel confident that what they were going to teach them were things that I would look for in any man to make sure that my son wasn't led astray or that he would be confused or, or there was going to be any kind of conflict about, you know, the things that he might be learning, because one of the conditions for the relationship with each of them is that it had to stay between them and him. And if they, wait, I'm sorry, did we disconnect? I'm no, getting a I, I can hear you Car carry on about Warriors okay. Rising. Okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so I had to feel confident that and my son had to feel confident that the relationships with them were between them and, and, and I wasn't a part of it, so he would not be afraid to share with, him, share with them his intimate feelings or his thoughts or, his, or, or, or questions he might have that he might not want to ask a mom. Yeah, so, so it was a trust that was factor. Really yeah, that was, that was really important. So what, so, Thinking about those aspects of their character, I also had to do a personal values assessment about what were the things that I wanted my son to, to, to learn from them or get from them. Things like um, a, the, the sense of responsibility to community, the idea of respect for women, the concept of um, self-determination, um, understanding that what it means to make be responsible for your decisions and being held accountable. Those kind of values I think are really important for every person. So when I looked around in my circle of friends, we came up actually with five men that I thought would 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 be awesome. And but I thought my ask was so big that the reason for the five was because I expected that we would get some no's because that's a lot to ask of, you know, these professional men who, as you described, one was an engineer, one is a um, successful uh, entrepreneur that has a, 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 a magazine, another one is a philanthropist, another one financial planner, planner, and they all have busy lives. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, it, it so, so when I, but what, what was so amazing was when I made the ask, each one of them quickly, I, they said yes so fast my head spun. And I was so moved that the responses that I got is, oh, Marianne, I'd be honored. Or, oh, absolutely, thank you for asking. I, 
one of them teared up and cried and told me how, how, how much it meant to them that I even asked them to do it. So I, it, it was, I was so taken by the incredible way that they just stepped up and leaned in. And um, so, so the four men are just, you know, super incredible, remarkable people, generous of heart. And, you know, one of the things that also happened was I, I thought that, you know, we were just looking at uh, the, the, the teenage years. You know, I, I'm thinking I needed help, you know, with, with um, getting my son's questions answered that I couldn't answer. And by the time he finished, you know, 18, 19 years old, and he was ready to, you know, launch on his own, that that's where it would end. But when they all showed up for his, and they all came to his high school graduation, mm -hmm. it was amazing. They flew in for his graduation to mark that milestone. And one of them, Uncle Chris in the book, took my son by his shoulders, looked him in the eyes and said, now the real mentoring begins. And I, would, I, I don't, I, there's no words to describe that my son is now 25 and they still are a, a bonded as a circle of men who are there for him in every way, shape and form. And I can't, now looking back, I don't even know how I could have gotten through all those years without them. Sure. Well, Marianne, were there any, what am I doing moments? Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> tell us about yeah. it. Yeah, so, well, you know, one of the things that was really hard, and I know your moms out there will relate to this, is giving up control, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm saying to the, the four mentors, look, you know, I'm trusting you with my son and everything is between you and him. And you only, I, I don't wanna know what's, you know what the conversation is about or what you're talking about except for on a need to know basis. Now, with that said, and that being the agreement, I can't tell you how many times one of them had to tell me, uh, now remember what you said, you not supposed to be in this. This is between Max and, and me. So it was very difficult to um, really kind of step back. And oftentimes, you know, I, I, you know, after a conversation that they had had privately, or a visit that they had privately, it was very hard for me to resist the questions, you know, like, well, what did he tell you? Well, what did y'all do? And I had to back up and, and, and let that go. So that was, that was hard to really, um, you know, step out of it and, and let them trust that the warriors take care of the warrior, you know? And um, that's, that's a special bond that they have, and um, I'm just respectful of it. That was difficult. I'm that, that was the hardest part. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I mean, you know, Marianne, we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna come back and, and chat about Warrior Rising. Stay with us. Kamori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Welcome back to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, and our special guest today is Marianne Howland, and she's the author of Warriors Rising, How Four Men Helped a Boy 
um, on his journey to manhood. It, this is so interesting. So, Marianne, before we went to break, let's bring the audience up to speed and tell us how did you create the Black Misfa? Um, well, so I had never been to a bar mitzvah myself be before. In fact, I just went to my first bar mitzvah a week ago, and it was just the most incredible experience. And, and I, you know, I, I, after watching this young 13 year old boy go through that celebration with his community and his family, it brought me to tears because I realized I would so wish that every black boy had that same experience of that kind of rite of passage. So, so since I had never seen one before uh, last week, what I understood about the bar mitzvah is that it's really based on three tenets, faith, community, and accountability. And I really thought that that was, um, you know, just, just super important, important and, and a great foundation for creating something our own. Now, because we're African-American, um, you know, I, I created something that fit our culture. And of course, we, you know, we don't read the Torah, we read the Bible. So, yes. um, so one of the things that I had my son do was uh, find a passage in the Bible that he thought was most um, relevant for him at that moment, which he did. And then I asked him to, um, for the four mentors, write them each a letter describing to them what he admired about them and then share with them what he would like to learn from them. And then one of the mentors, which is one of my brothers, gave him an assignment to write an essay on what it means to be a, a man. And so those are the things he did to prepare himself for his, his celebration. And then I worked with um, my very dear friend, who's the wife of one of the mentors, Ramona. And Ramona and I. <laughs> um, I know Ramona. But, yeah, I know you know Ramona. And Chris and, and Max. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so we, you know, just just sort of came up with some activities for the course of this week. It was a weekend celebration. And the activities were designed to be bonding experiences for the men and Max. Now the four men did not know one another before this either. So we had a, um, a golfing outing, golf outing where um, my son was the caddy. And then there was a real men cook where each of them um, prepared their favorite recipe. And, and it was an opportunity for Max to, uh, to not only experience the kitchen, but also learn a really, one really important lesson. Now, I, t I told you my son has cerebral palsy, so his fine motor skills are a little bit challenged. So I would never let him like use a knife in the kitchen to cut anything, especially at this age, he's only 13. And um, so, but Uncle Chris, he was like, Oh no, he's a man. He know how he, he doesn't know. He need to learn how to get in the kitchen. He can use a knife. And so using cutting a guacamole, I mean cutting an avocado to make guacamole, that was um, my son's first lesson with, you know, like actually on his own using a knife to like, you know, prepare for a meal. And it was it was powerful to just see the expression in my son's eyes that I can do this. You know, and it came in with a nod from Uncle Chris saying, you got this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it made me also recognize that, you know, mothering him, I had been smothering him, oh. that I really needed to allow him to just do what he could do. And so, um, so there was that. And then we had um, uh, a, a, a boat outing and, and Max got to drive the boat and, you know, so, so there were these moments where the um, men got to, you know, meet one another, hang out, play video games, talk trash, all that kind of stuff that men do. And, and then on for the actual dinner party or birthday celebration with the cake and all, for that, um, that ceremony, that was the opportunity for each of the men. And, and mind you, 
Karen, I did not, I didn't orchestrate it. I didn't, I, I wasn't that organized. This was kind of a, let you know, making it up as we go. Sure. It was the men who, each of them took turns that on their own decided to, like, talk to John Ron, uh, Max and explain to him from a personal space what, what their commitment was to him, what they expected of him, why they loved him. It was so beautiful. I, I, I sobbed. I was just crying the oh. whole time because I had no idea what we had actually created. And it was just a really beautiful evening. And um, my son left that table and you could see him walk a little ta taller. I mean, he, it, that was transformational just that through that one weekend. He, on the other side of that, he, you know, found a, the strength in himself. He saw himself through their eyes and that made a tremendous difference. Well, you know, we can hear and feel the passion, uh, Marianne, and that just fills a mother's, a parent's heart, I should say. But, you know, from your book, it's about the advanced praise for Warrior Rising. They say it takes a village. And while that may be true, sometimes it takes an army of men to bring a boy beyond the shadow of adolescence uh, uh, into the harsh daylight and Truths of Adulthood, Warrior Rising is a book for our times. This is from Erica Alexander, actor, writer, producer, entrepreneur. What would you tell the women out there? Give them some advice that have challenges with raising their child um, that has mental, um, emotional, spiritual, physical challenges. What would you tell them to where to start? to just be, just go forward and take care of them? Uh, well, before I answer that question, I just want to make sure that your audience knows that Erica Alexander is the actress in Living Single, the one who played the lawyer. Yes. You remember her? Yes. Yeah. That's Erica. All right. Yeah. Sister Power. So, yeah, right. So she, and she, she's, you want to have her on your show in the future. She's remarkable. But um, it up. so what I would what I would say is one of the things that you know we 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 many of us are really good parents. You know we want you know we're you know making sure they're in the best schools and you know that they're um, active and and have an opportunity to try many different things and sports and music and you you know what I mean to give them a, a holistic background to find out what they're good at and, 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 you know, ferry them back and forth between the points. We're really good at that. But what, where I would sort of ask parents to really dig deep is, is to get to know, how do you get to know your child? And what mm -hmm. I mean by get to know is, you know, understanding, first of all, respecting them for their own opinion respecting them for having their own ideas and taking time to really listen. And because my son and I are, are clearly are very close because of all of his, the time we've had to spend together because of his, um, you know, all the challenges that he, that he had. And one of the things that I had to do was to be ever mindful of listening to him about what he's feeling, what he's thinking. Um, and, and that, that takes, a, a, it takes time. And, and I want to make sure that we are taking that time to really understand and, and assess, know who their friends are. You know, you hear that often, you know, when a, a child goes astray or, you know, something bad happens, you know, they drugs or, or even, you know, they try to take their life or mm. something drastic happens. And then you're saying, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I, you know, I thought he was fine. Well, if check-ins, so, you know, my son and I would do check-ins, you know, on a regular basis and where I'd sit down and talk to him about, you know, well, you know, well, what are you feeling and, 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 and help him wrestle with what he might be struggling with as best that I could. And that's why I say, you know, when I, when he got to be 13 and this was key, 
I'll never forget when repeatedly I was getting the response to when I would ask him, how you doing? Or what's going on? And he would say to me, you won't understand. And he said that by the, about the you know, 10th time I heard that, I went, you know what? Maybe I don't understand. And that's one of the reasons that, that began this, where this idea percolated. And I went, you know what? But maybe we should find you somebody who might understand. And in his case, I knew that might be another man or men who he could talk to because, you know, he's a typical boy. And I knew that there were things that were coming up for him that I couldn't answer. I'm not a boy. I don't, you know, you know, he, one of the things that he struggled with, and it was to the point where, and I talk about this in the book, is bullying. Bullying was my son's bane of his existence. You know, this is a young man who, you know, up until, you know, the teen years had a lot of self-esteem and he was absolutely fine. But then when the other kids are calling him cripple mm -hmm. and the girls are treating him like he has the cooties, when, you know, when you're that kid and he knew when he looked in the mirror, he, he saw what they saw. Yeah. And that began to really eat at him in a way that caused him to go through severe depression. And there was nothing that, and, and you know, I, all I could do was hug him. And of course I wanted to beat up all the kids at the school, which made, you know, totally irrational. But, um, and so these men I knew would, or hoped would be able to give him some tools in his toolbox to use to fight, because he's a fighter. So how do you, you know, how, how do you stand up for yourself? You know, how to, how to, how to, you know, handle this kind of abuse that was, you know, that a lot of kids suffer through, but just don't know how to handle, don't know what, you know, how to deal with it. Yeah, well, you know what, Marianne, so, this, we're going to have to have a part two. It is so <laughs> much to cover in this book, bullying and how do you let go? And I just want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your courage. You know, you, you have to dig deep to have this type of strength for yourself and for your son. So with that said, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on Sister Part. And we're going to schedule for part two. And oceans of aloha, peace, joy, love, and happiness. Aloha.